Welcome to My View from the Piano Bench. We do this on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. here on my Joel Holtz Notes YouTube channel, in addition to Piano for My Friends on Thursday evening. Thursday evenings. You'll see a link to the support page of my website in the video description. Thank you to all of you who support and encourage me via the means available on that page. If you go there, take a look. Appreciate if you do. And thank you for being here, most importantly. So, topic for today. Simple topic, but one that actually never got just its own uh, little focus here. Two words, steady gigs. Musicians rely on steady gigs. Uh, sometimes exclusively, which is always dangerous, but more practically, with a sense of uh, irons in the fire and managing those irons in the fire. And I just realized there's a light here. I'm going to reach over. I don't have real lighting here. I turn every light in the house on <laughs> in order to uh, do this appropriately. So hopefully this works. Uh, and... You know, we, we all find our way with juggling things because being a musician is being a contract worker, a gig worker. You know, the word gig is, you know, our life as a musician. But in recent years, it's kind of come more into the uh, general vernacular, the uh, more typical vocabulary. Uh, and the term gig worker now applies to the, the Uber driver and, and people like that. And... You know, with, with a sense, as that's become more culturally prevalent, that there's something wrong with that. And then we have to, like, make gig, gig workers into, into employees, <laughs> which was a real problem uh, when that was put, being pushed. I haven't heard about this for a couple of years, so I guess it got resolved. But they were pushing a law in California, and basically it would have destroyed the, uh, the, the, the gigging music business because it would have required you know, people who hire contractors to make them employees. And it just doesn't work, especially in, in, in our business. And some people gig work by choice. It is a problem in the, in, 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 in the music business in, in terms of people wanting to have a sense of security. You know, this is not for everyone. But for some people, it absolutely is for them whether or not it is music. Now that's something that in music therapy uh, is one of those unpleasant encounters that idealistic young students have when they want to go into music therapy. You know, they find out once they're you know, in progress with it, if not all the way there, that their best shot at making it work is a gig approach, a contract approach. You know, there aren't a lot of, there are some, there aren't a lot of full-time uh, employee positions as a music therapist. Again, there are, but gig working is the uh, best way to go, contract work, and that's certainly the case with the music business. I remember there was one pianist, and a, this is years and years ago, at a restaurant in New Jersey where, where, where I came up, and he was there for years, he was there six nights a week, and he would just go out and say I'm the only musician I know who gets a you know two weeks paid vacation a year and my taxes withheld and health insurance. Yep, that that does happen. He was an employee of uh, of that restaurant. That, that was the Silver Lake Inn in Clementon, New Jersey, way back in the day. Wonder what ever happened to Jimmy Rudolph. Uh, but again, our reality is that that we juggle things, and this came to mind today because last night, uh, and if you follow me on Facebook, you saw some posts about this, uh, I picked up a, a steady Tuesday night at a, a really nice uh, restaurant, uh, Stanford Grill. It's part of a larger, I don't know if the other ones in the chain are also called Stanford Grill. I don't know how that works, but a single person, a musician friend, books these different restaurants and they have jazz trios every night. Well, they've said every night, but it's actually five nights a week. And as of this week, 
they started full seven, Monday and Tuesday. And I know this musician friend of mine kind of had it on his radar screen when one of those nights opened up to, to throw me in there. And it's, it, it, it's fun. It's, it's distance from me. It's the kind of thing I would not want to do several nights a week. But one night a week, you know, it, it's fun. It's, I want to say, it's a night out because I'm kind of always out. But, you know, all these things have their different energies. And in this particular case, doing a trio with uh, Amy Shook and Scott Silbert uh, and myself is going to be like a night out. It's going to be, you know, night out with, with the buds, you know, and you, and, and you get to you get to play and, it, and it's really cool. Uh, so just reflecting on all of that. So I went ahead and just started writing down uh, the uh, steadies that I've had. Uh, and top of the list, though, before I did that, I did write down Jimmy Rudolph and the Silver Lake Inn, uh, but also famously Dave McKenna, who uh, was, you know, he relied for a lot of his career on a steady gig, the Copley Plaza in, uh, in Massachusetts, right? Uh, and fa famous for that gig, but that's just, you know, not the norm. He had it for a while, he lost it. Uh, not lost it, the, the music business changed. He didn't know what to do. He did other things. He came back to it. You know, there's, there's always this uncertainty. So I, I made a list of steady things. I'm sure I've left things out. But one that I realized at the end were, was a church position. And I'll refer to those kind of things also as anchor gigs. You know, when, when, they're, when they're significant enough that you can build everything else around it, but then you're dependent on it. So with this gig at the uh, Sanford Grill with, with Amy and, and Scott on a Tuesday night, which crazily is like the only open night I could have made this work <laughs> for the most part. And I will have to sell it out on occasion, but for the most part, I, uh, I'm open. You know, it's not going to you know throw me for a loop or knock me over or maybe get a nosebleed or something if it goes away. Uh, if it were like a five night a week thing, then it's like, okay, what do I do? So you're always juggling all that. And now I'm thinking, before I go into the list, I'm going to play something. Uh, and I could play something from a church position days, but I'll play one of the one of the requests we got last night, which is fun. Having played this tune, I forgot it. You know, forget about this tune forever. Uh, cocktails for two, yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, let's try it again. Let's see if I can get more than two notes out. <laughs>
remember that tune though being particularly fun last night at the time when we did it. Uh, not related to this subject, but just on my radar screen all the time, and in particular last night, but even just now, is, you know, being in that space and waiting. And that that's something that's in my list of things to talk about here. And I haven't really figured out exactly how to frame it yet, but the bottom line is wait. And wait some more. And keep waiting while you're playing. Don't play. Wait. Feels like it takes forever. But after about a second and a half, you've waited long enough. And that that's its own struggle, you know. Uh, but let's not get esoteric and metaphysical here. Let's talk about practical things like steady gigs. An anchor gig as a church musician. You build things around it. Uh, but here's some steady things that I'm going to... I'm sure I've forgotten something, but one will be the showboat gig. You've heard me talk about that. And, you know, in that that was six days a week, in that, that it was almost 100 miles from my house. It was, it was, it was two hours away. I live in Elkton. It was Atlantic City. You know, it was a major part, you know, of, 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 of what I did. And it was, you know, I relied on that. And when that went away, it was a big scramble. But when it came, it was really great because things were kind of light at the time. So th there's always a, if you accept this, you know, a, a being led, providential, guided, you know, where you're supposed to be, this falls into place element to it. Another that you've heard me talk about is the, uh, the food court gig at the Cherry Hill Mall. Really unlikely uh, thing. Uh, and... With the exception of, oh, I forgot about that one. Yeah, with the exception of one that I forgot to put here, none of these are things that I actually pursued. Uh, they're just things that happened along the way and they turned out to be steady on one level or another. But the food court, which happened for years prior to uh, the showboat, uh, was another everyday thing, but it was two hours a day. It was m mostly lunchtime, sometimes dinner time, but noon to two, man, you know, you have doubles. You go here and you go there and, you, you know, you manage it that way. I was the picnic pianist at the Cherry Home Mall. So we had those two, which were like everyday gigs. Uh, the showboat was a themed thing. And that was fun because, I mean, every gig has a theme, so to speak, or, you know, parameters that, that you stay within. And typically for me, it's just, it's jazz or, you know, you know st stuff that I do. But some things are specific. You know, church music is, is specific. A theme park casino is specific, you know. Uh... Let me see. Let me play a tune from my showboat days. I don't know what to play.
Michigan J. Frog, right? Hello, my baby. Oh, I have no idea. What did I just do? Uh, you know that Warner Brothers frog? It's kind of, the, you know, the emblem of Warner Brothers. If, I may have this wrong, but I'm pretty sure that character only appeared in the one cartoon. Uh, one Warner Brothers cartoon where, you know, he gets found in a box and sings for the guy who finds him and nobody else and tortures the next guy a hundred years later. And there you go. Uh, so, yeah, not another study gig that I actually haven't talked about. There's a couple that I haven't talked about much here. Uh, the Sullivan Steakhouse gigs. Oh my goodness, when, when they happened. Uh, and like the Stanford Grill, there's a central person who coordinates and books all the musicians. Uh, in the case of the Stanford Grill, he gives uh, musicians in the jazz trios their own nights, sometimes multiple nights. Uh, and it's their gig, and when they have to be someplace else, they can sub it out. And that's an important thing to have that kind of gig. And that's one way a steady gig is managed, where it's already understood that you have other irons in the fire and you just make sure your gig is covered. So that's going to mean that the gig is, you know, less about you individually and more about the gig itself, which is fine. You know, just obviously if, if the gig is about, you know, somebody's name on the marquee, you know, somebody's name who's not on the marquee shouldn't be there in place of the person. Uh, and and Sullivan's uh, was a different kind of arrangement where it was booked month to month according to everyone's availability. So even though I call it a, a steady gig, the schedule could have changed and did sometimes month to month, but you put in your availability you know, the, the month before, and then you were slotted in. And a lot of times it was the same night of the week. And for a while, I was working in two Sullivan Steakhouses who were booked by the same person. At the time, they had live jazz in their bar uh, and all their restaurants. Uh, and, and that resulted in me working Sullivan steadily several nights a week uh, for, for a while which is really cool. And that was its own theme, uh, not entirely unlike like the showboat, uh, a, a jazz theme. Uh, and any gig, steady or otherwise, uh, is subject to evolution. And evolution is actually a good thing because evolution kind of keeps you, mm, not keeps you, keeps the product itself from being stale because it's allowed to be steered by forces which may also include like like the will of management and stuff so that all of a sudden it's just not irrelevant like you know why am i doing the same thing i was doing 15 years ago says the restaurant manager done right uh and this is a subject with the uh the jazz festivals particularly the traditional jazz festivals uh, many of them are no longer around, and the ones that are have adjusted. And the ones that didn't adjust just got smaller and smaller every year until they just withered away. So that kind of, you know, dynamic evolution is good uh, until it's not. <laughs> so Sullivan's started out... Uh, trying to be, they started with groups. But I think I played solo from the beginning as well. So yeah, there were shifts. They were duos or trios. I think trios with no drummers and solo piano. And I would typically have a solo piano shift early and then another band would come in uh, later. And then eventually they compressed it and got rid of the two shifts and made everything duo. And <laughs> the night that happened, by the way, uh, I was running late for my for my shift, uh, but it was actually okay. It was a loose environment, and it was just me. And I would just walk in and rip the cover off, start going, and then make adjustments in my breaks. Yeah, you know, it was a really really loose situation. If I was running running late, that could happen. Uh, and if that were to happen, it was just a few minutes, and it was all loose. But one 
day. And this is like prior to cell phones, so you can't really call people. And you wouldn't want to anyway, right? Uh, the I was like 15 minutes off. So it, it wasn't good. Uh, I would get away with it, but, you know, no, not good. But I didn't know that they had made a change to duos as of that night. And I walk in, and there's Bruce Kaminsky sitting on, sitting there in the chair with his bass, just sitting there, like, not knowing what's going on, waiting for me to show up. I'm like, what? So I had to feel the curveball of, I don't get to play solo. My attitude at the time was, let me play solo. Just get out of my way. And it's like, now, now I've drawn attention to it. I'm totally embarrassed. I'm playing a gig I didn't intend to play. Leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> but actually what that started was a wonderful series of, of events and years of playing duo gigs with, with Bruce, who I love, and many other wonderful bass players. Uh, and that's a commentary also on not being in control of what's going on uh, in, in, in gigs like that. But also that evolution just kept happening uh, and it eventually evolved away from the jazz and now it's more of a more of a pop thing but we're talking like 25 years uh, of that and the I guess proof of the value of the evolution is that as far as I know those gigs are still happening or, or at least to some extent or if they're not still happening they've happened for a long time over 20 years uh, so that's another one. Uh, and that reminds me of one that I actually probably never mentioned or maybe mentioned once in uh, another context. A gig that Sure Jazz picked up. Uh, we had it for several years, a steady Saturday night in Lewis, Delaware. You know, kind of like the... Uh, mm, Whatever gig I was at, I, I guess the Stanford Grill, where you could sub sub out, because uh, the steady gigs in like restaurants don't necessarily pay a lot of money, you know, and so it's kind of understood that you're going to sub sub them out when something comes along that you know pays better and you kind of need it. And we had this trio, but we could sub out each of our members. It was a little more difficult to sub me out. Uh, because of the specific thing I did. But there were a couple people who could do it. And I remember one night I subbed out so I could go hear Chick Corea when he came to Eastern Shore. Yeah, uh, Not something I typically do, not sub out a gig for another gig. But yeah, and uh, that was a wonderful run. And the reason that happened is because the owner of the restaurant got it. He wanted it, he got it. And that's really what it takes. The magic is when the owner gets it. Uh, and it's not like with Sullivan's where like the management is being told what to do from corporate. And then you have to navigate that little bit and you get the manager guy to like see the value of it or whatever. Or or with the showboat, you know, whoever's running the entertainment department probably knows nothing about music. <laughs> and then that's just all business. And it's like, are you dressed properly? What do you look like? You know, and, and, and all that. That's a ridiculous business. Uh, so, Bessame went under eventually. They weren't doing well. And this isn't the only gig where this was the case. But, yeah, I think the only night at the end they were making money was the night we were there. Oh, my God. Well, it's good, you know? You have to keep your gig until the place actually shuts down. Which makes me think of this tune, just the title, Bessame.
Besame root theorem. So the last two studies that I thought of in doing this uh, are, you know, ones I talk about all the time, particularly the one that's still happening, mainstay. Uh, and that's an amazing, unique scenario. So there are templates in which studies can happen. And then there are just one of a kind, only in that circumstance scenarios. And not everybody really has understood that Mainstay Mondays in particular were that kind of thing. Uh, but you had to be sort of inside it and one of the two people, myself and the then director of the Mainstay, uh, to, to understand, you know, it was totally organic and being put together and totally circumstantial to the circumstances. Oh man, I am getting less uh, verbally fluid all the time. I either need some caffeine or I need to just shut up and play. So maybe I'll shut up and play and mention that last night, and if you follow me on Facebook, you'll you'll see this. Uh, I guess, you know, it's kind of like a celebratory yay thing that Amy Scott and I were joined by Steve Abshire for the first set. And he plays there steady Thursday, Friday, and Saturday or Wednesday, three nights a week, I think. Excuse me. Uh, but he's not on Tuesdays. He didn't want to take another night or, so, or, or something. Uh, but if you follow me a little bit, you might recognize Amy Shook, Joe Holt, Scott Silbert, Steve Abshire, Schobert Shires, right? So I, I was joking that this gig is like the Schobert Shires minus Steve Abshire. So it's like, ah, uh, but Schobert hold the Shire. <laughs> uh, which, yeah. Uh, but there was Steve with his big birth of rhythm guitar. Just, to, just to, the kind of guitar that you would play like in a concert hall with a big band and chunk chords and not have to be mic'd. Right? And he just played rhythm guitar for, for, for a set. And yeah, you know, that, that, that first set, you know, it was a quartet and it was great. And it was the Schobert Shires. And I leaned over to Amy midway through and said, you got any super glue? Super glue? Yeah, I want to super glue Steve to his chair. He's not allowed to leave. You know, because uh, when you have this chunky rhythm guitar player you know, going on in the rhythm section with no drummer, it adds so much. And then, of course, when he's gone, it's like, where'd it go? I have to start, you know, doing more stuff. It's a wonderful circumstance to play in a rhythm section with a guitar. But it also me means you can just sit there on your hands for a while. You know, so taking the guitar away put me back on my toes but i know the first tune we did
two. Uh, so the one uh, steady gig, other than what I I may have forgotten, which I'm sure is something, probably something, uh, would be uh, that one. I'm confused. Okay, JR's Pub. There it is. And what was significant about, well, actually, there's another gig that I actually purposely left out. Uh, but I'll describe it. It was uh, it was a gig that I went and in another city around here because I didn't think that this would be viable in Chestertown. When I realized that you know, if I'm really like in the model of Dave McKenna, you know, the meat and potatoes of what he did was restaurant work, and I really wasn't doing solo restaurant work. I said, I gotta find a hotel, I gotta find a place, you know? So I targeted one of the bigger towns on the Eastern Shore, and I didn't usually do this with those kind of gigs, with restaurants and stuff. I would do it for concerts and venues, but for this, you know, I went and I made the pitch. You know, and I went down and, 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 and I got the gig and played a Sunday brunch for uh, quite a while. And the, uh, the idea was that really, that's what I should be doing as a solo piano player. And, uh, it, and it went away, but then this uh, piano bar opportunity sometime later came up in, in Chestertown, which interestingly, that or weirdly, or typically for me, I don't know, I turned down for months. Uh, another piano player, Philip Dutton, was administering it and he was booking guys in because I just didn't think it fit me. but. He talked me into it and, you know, it was the kind of thing, well, around here, uh, people really support local musicians. And so, like, whoever was playing the piano bar on a particular night, the local people would come out to support their local musician friends. And if somebody was playing from out of town, there was one night where nobody came, you know, so that's its own dynamic down here. But that became, I guess, the closest to like a normal solo piano, long-standing restaurant gig uh, for me. The kind of thing you would expect somebody like me to do. Now, when you say piano bar, you might think... <laughs> Don't ask me to sing you a song because I'm the piano man, because I want to keep my job. Uh, I don't know if I brought this up here. When I was doing those remote bike tour shows this year, one of, one of the things I've added uh, is to play a medley of Piano Man. Two different songs called Piano Man. Uh, one from Earl Hines in the 30s that no one ever heard of, unless you're a fan of Earl Hines from the 30s. Uh, and then the Billy Joel tune. And, that, and what I'll just say is these, both these songs have the same title. Would you recognize it from the first tune? And nobody does. Uh, and, and it's funny, some musician, like Piano Man is one of those tunes that some musicians I know will refuse to play. And you know, you, you, that, that kind of falls into the, like the New York, New York category, right? Uh, and one musician, and, and it's funny, all the musicians in the thread knew about the Earl Hines Piano Man. Some say, I play the Earl Hines one, people ask for Piano Man. <laughs> you know, so, here we go, Piano Man. How did I get here?
go. Piano man, piano man. Ain't no one who spanks those ivories like he can. All about biology, he knows not a thing, but pianoology, he's really king. Different song. Yeah, of course. Oh, my goodness. So, last night at Stanford Grill, <laughs> the management, like I said, had made the decision with the musician who books the, the trios in to extend the trios to seven nights a week instead of five. Uh, and this had been in the works for, you know, a few weeks. Apparently, the staff didn't get the memo. And, you know, the staff there, or at least the, you know, people who answer the phone and seat you and serve you and, and that, that kind of thing. I'm sure the management knew. Uh, but when my friend Beth uh, called to make a reservation to come in, she said, I want to sit near the band. I want to be able to hear the band. Oh, we don't have a band tonight. She came anyway because she trusted it was going to happen, and it did. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, not everybody got, it got the memo. But it also kind of tells you how important, uh, important is the wrong word, the position of the music there. It's, it's basically part of the wallpaper. It's part of the scene, the audio wallpaper. Yeah. It, it, it's what I would call it. So, like, if you go to their website, it says, you know, a live jazz trio uh, plays nightly. Uh, and it will never list the personnel, and it really doesn't matter, because it's a thing. It's a, it's, it's a jazz trio. Uh, social media will allow now more of a connection with, like, you know, individual musicians saying they're going to be there and people coming for them. Uh, you know, and that's something to talk about. I always write things down that I want to talk about. Uh, and then I never look at these things. I file them. Social media versus mail. Back in the day when we had to uh, have our mailing list and lick stamps on envelopes. Uh, okay, I won't go down that road. I could go down that road, but I won't. Uh, so if you are in the neighborhood of the Baltimore Washington corridor uh, Stanford Grill in Columbia Maryland is it's a really nice restaurant and my my friends uh, were impressed uh, Beth came with her with her best friend Becky and Suede came which was fun she had a show this weekend in the area and she was here and and that that, that was fun to see her uh, I guess I'll play Swade's request to end. I thought about you. But I'll play it in the key I'm used to playing it in. Not the key we played it in last night, where I took the melody of the first chorus and I flubbed it. Because uh, I wasn't sure where it was going on the bridge. But I'm going to flub it now because I don't know what's going on there ever. What tune did I say? I didn't. At least I did.
Thanks for being here. See you tomorrow for piano for my friends. Maybe see you in person sometime soon. Thank you.